Um, so to my left is Katie Harbath, who is the Global Politics and Government Outreach Director at Facebook. Um, next to her is Dr. Candace Hope, the founding director at the Cleveland Marshall Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection. Um, then we have Sonia Kelly, who is the director of Freedom on the Net at Freedom House. They put out uh, that important report each year, um, measuring trends online. And then finally, we have the Honorable Ellen Weintraub, the uh, vice chair of the Federal Election Commission. So we're very excited um, to talk to everyone. Uh, each, each, of, each of the panelists has a unique spin on this topic, and um, we'll hear a little bit from each of them and hopefully answer some, some of the overarching questions. Uh, but first of all, you know, just jumping into the topic, we were really set up excellently by the, the keynotes this morning. There are so many issues um, we're dealing with from elections themselves, from the process of voting, um, from online advertising around elections and around um, critical social issues to really larger questions of freedom of expression and speech online. Um, all of these uh, are, are critical to dem democracy and democratic processes, and all of them are being certainly influenced by the internet and uh, perhaps disrupted. So I wanted to first ask the panel, um, how do you see this disruption? Is, is the internet disrupting dis democracy and is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How has it changed in the past few years? And um, you know, what, from your vantage point, is the most critical piece of this disruption? Let's start with Katie. Sure. Thanks so much for thanks so much for having me. I think I've I've been involved in digital politics here in DC since 2003, before Facebook even existed and was even created. I think you know for a long time we all had a very optimistic view of what the internet and technology could do in terms of giving more people a voice and leveling the playing field, if you will, when it comes to democracy and elections. And I think that at the end of the day, that's still going to be the case. However, we certainly saw things that happened on our own platform that shouldn't have in 2016. We need to be doing more to be more diligent about protecting the integrity of elections on our platform. And that needs to be our focus first and foremost. And there's never going to be a point in time where we're done, where we can say that we've solved it. Because bad actors are always going to be trying to find new ways in which to use platforms such as ours or new platforms or anything new that comes along the, the way with technology. Um, and so we need to be working as part of the broader community of thinking about how we can combat this so that we can continue to give more people a voice in elections and helping more people to be part of the civic engagement process. Thank you. Um, I do election cybersecurity and voting system security. So as you can well imagine, from my standpoint, the internet has presented some negative disruptive capacities, especially in the past couple of years. Um, it's not as if this computer security community had not been warning of this since uh, at least 2002, uh, including testimony on, on Capitol Hill and in the executive office of the president for multiple presidents. Uh, so uh, now we have the capacity to not only disrupt, but uh, undermine our election process in a wholesale, not only retail uh, manner, and that is truly disturbing. Well, at Freedom House, I have uh, worked on uh, measuring and evaluating the state of internet freedom for eight years now, since we started our Freedom on the Net report. And it has been incredible to observe the changes that the internet has brought both to democracy, but then also as a tool uh, to authoritarian regimes. But let me first start with the positives. Uh, I have not seen yet uh, the extent to which, uh, to which uh, we've seen so many people engaged in political processes and engaged in speaking out online. And this is particularly the case in authoritarian regimes where uh, the media is owned by the state and the only people for, uh, and the only way for the people to express themselves and to really inform themselves is uh, to go online. We have seen positive changes emerge in countries like Saudi Arabia, in uh, places throughout the Middle East. Even in China, we've seen activists and we've seen netizens actually trying to push the boundaries of what kind of speech is allowed online. 
But with, with that said, uh, throughout our research, we have also documented many negative ways. And those are uh, the ways and those are the practices that I think we're all now trying to figure out what to do about. Uh, one of them is this issue of manipulation. The latest edition of Freedom on the Net specifically deals with different ways how governments around the world are now using the internet to manipulate the information. And with Freedom on the Net, we examined 65 countries. And in 30 out of those 65 countries, we have documented the cases in which governments have either used uh, paid pro-government commentators, bots, uh, fake news, and other methods to uh, either uh, the main political position to really, or to really uh, uh, spread a narrative in a way that's beneficial to them. Uh, so this is obviously an area of huge concern. We've also documented ways in which now authorities can surveil their own citizens. And uh, this is particularly a concern, again, uh, in countries where uh, checks and balances are not in place. So we've seen through the years, uh, not only the regular type of sur surveillance that you hear about and read about in the newspapers, but also the scary types. Like, for example, in Bahrain, uh, during political protests, the government uh, scouting the internet and uh, using uh, imaging detection software to actually see who was uh, in political protests and, uh, and based on those images going after those people. Or just looking at the examples during Euromaidan protests in Ukraine, where participants in protests would suddenly get text, messaging, uh, text messages saying, well, you have been now recorded as a participant in disruptive uh, political pr uh, practices. So definitely a lot of opportunities, but a lot of concerns, and I look forward to discussing them today. Hi, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be part of this panel, particularly an all-women panel at, at a tech conference. How cool is that? <laughs> um, the, the answer to the question as to whether the net has been a positive or negative disruptive force on democracy is yes. Um, uh, yes, it's provided a great platform for citizen engagement and for people who might not otherwise be able to find like-minded individuals to uh, find each other and engage in productive conversations that get them more excited about politics and, and perhaps more interested in turning out to vote, uh, which would be critical to me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also know that there are bad actors out there who are taking advantage of the very benefits of the open and free nature of the internet to try and disrupt uh, democracies, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Um, uh, I think the work that Freedom House is doing is so critical. Most facts, by the way, is over the internet now, if you didn't know. It's not over a telephone, and even most telephone uh, is over the internet now. Uh, so, so we're talking about all of our communications. Um, uh, it's uh, not like online shopping. That's usually the comparison that's given because online shopping is uh, a relationship where the identities of both parties, both sides to the transaction, are completely known. There's a record of the transaction, and if there's a flaw in the transaction, it can be recovered and corrected, right? But we do not want to do that with voting. We do not want to provide, and we've actually barred, receipts in voting because that leads to vote buying and selling. And one of the threats for internet voting or online voting is that we could automate, actually criminal syndicates could automate vote buying and selling, and that would be a huge threat to our elections in addition to, of course, all the other kinds of threats. Now, rather than become very uh, specific about the range of threats, let me just invite you to think about all the types of attacks that you have heard that have occurred in the past two years. Um, one that's going to receive some attention today is the Equifax attack. Um, there have been uh, DDoS attacks on banks. There have been spoofing, phishing. You go right down the list. Every kind of attack that you have heard of against a major company with major investments in security can be brought against election systems. Every single one. And yet our election systems are some of the, uh, and operations are some of the most poorly funded um, governmental operations in our entire nation. Why? Because sometimes the arguments are, well, we don't use them very often. 
<laughs> and some of the others are that many of, of uh, the, the people who are in charge of budgeting and procurement decide that they really don't understand the security issues and they do respond to the good marketing pitches. So what's uh, actually present in our states nationwide? Um, by and large, it is software-based systems that were bought with federal monies that were appropriated in 2002 that used legacy software from the late 1990s. Many of these systems have no extrinsic voter-created paper record that can be audited. And that's why our first keynoter was stressing this today, is that any software system can be made to cheat or it can have software bugs that, that force it to count improperly. Companies know this with their, their digital equipment. So they audit. That's just the smart thing to do. And they can conduct forensics evaluations. With elections, however, many of our state laws bar forensic activities. In fact, Jill Stein's litigation at the end of the 2016 um, elections, she litigated in several states, and she was barred from obtaining the forensics evaluations of equipment that had no independently auditable paper record. So when Senator Klobuchar and, and Senator Lindsey Graham and the, their cohorts in the House are asking for a federal monies to upgrade local election equipment, um, this is the reason. Because we have large sectors of the American public who are voting on equipment that cannot be made secure, and we cannot tell partly because of laws and partly because of the poor engineering, we cannot effectively audit or conduct forensics assessments on it. Even if it's hacked, it may not even have proof of that. It's poorly designed equipment for the modern age. It was never designed for the modern age of cyber attack. Nor were our election offices and their equipment and their staffing. And I assume everybody in this room knows the internet itself was never designed and engineered for security. Just wasn't. So we have a mismatch of activities. We have a, a, a huge need for high um, integrity, I mean uh, data integrity and uh, accuracy in votes, right? We want them recorded accurately, we want them tabulated accurately, and we want to be able to check on that. And yet we have a system, and particularly if it's sent over the internet, our votes, then um, we cannot assure any of those data integrity goals. So, so the, the concern right now is whether we are going to prepare ourselves in time for the 2018 elections and the 2020 elections. Their, bi their bipartisan bill seeks to do it. Thank you. I think one of the themes that that starts to tease out is how quickly the technology is evolving and how slow we are to respond to that. And I think that's also something that we saw with election ads, which I want to turn to yes. next, because, um, you know, not only are election ads trying to get out the message about candidates and about um, details of the election, they're instrumental in getting out the vote itself and bringing people to those polls. So I wanted to turn to Commissioner Weintraub to talk a little bit more about um, the trends that you saw in this recent election cycle, and at what point did did you realize that it was time to revisit um, the guidance that the, the commission uh, has for election advertising? And, and have you seen any trends from the comments that came in during that process? Well, this is something that I've been interested in for a while, because as I said, the last time we really took a comprehensive look at um, advert, political advertising online was 2006, and a lot has changed since then. It's um, one, one of the difficulties that we confront at the FEC is that our model is based on money and politics, on people spending money, and there's an awful lot of information that gets spread on the internet with very little uh, money being spent. Uh, there was a fascinating interview uh, by uh, Senator Warner from the Intelligence Committee recently where he pointed out that the, um, the information that they have about what uh, foreign governments have spent to disrupt elections around the world, in, in the United States, in France, in, in, um, in the Dutch election, uh, the cost of all of that was less than the cost of uh, one F-35 fighter or even an F-52 fighter, uh, for those that 
play those games. Um, <laughs> but the, um, you know, that's a really good investment for someone who wants to disrupt our elections. It doesn't, it doesn't cost that much. Uh, but that is not to say that there is not real money being spent. As uh, Senator Klobuchar pointed out this morning, the um, amount of political advertising that is going on right now has, is just skyrocketing. In 2012, we saw about $160 million in digital political advertising. By 2016, one presidential cycle later, it was up to $1.4 billion, an eight-fold increase. And that is real money. And, and that is something that justifies our taking another hard look at this. And uh, I am uh, one area that we are actually going to move forward on, and it's just a very small bite at, at this, is uh, the area of disclaimers on internet advertising that are uh, direct advocacy, what we call express <coughs> advocacy, vote, vote for, vote against certain candidates. Now, there's an awful lot of ads that don't say that, uh, and that won't be covered by this, but at least after um, throwing out, I don't know how many proposals over the years uh, about um, moving forward uh, both uh, in the internet context and also out of concern of uh, foreigners trying to intervene in our election and using this as a venue. Uh, we finally got consensus, a unanimous uh, consensus on the commission a few months ago. We have a, a draft in front of us right now and uh, I'm hoping that we are going to be able to move this rulemaking forward within this election cycle before the, you know, ads are running now, I get that, but um, we should be able to move quickly enough to uh, get new rules in place to at least require that there will be information available about where these direct advocacy ads are coming from. And that is really critical in order to be able to evaluate their credibility. And it is completely constitutional. We are looking at disclosure venues. Um, whenever, uh, you know, whenever we talk about writing any regulations, there are always people who are concerned, and, and I get this, that we're going to start regulating speech. We are not regulating speech. We are only talking about making sure that people understand where the information is coming from, where the speech is coming from. and. Um, uh, we really need to get at some way of, of blocking and, and ensuring that foreigners are not using the internet as a way of intervening in our election because it is absolutely illegal right now, laws on the books. Foreign nationals are not allowed to spend money uh, to try and uh, in connection with our elections. Um, the problem is finding it. And we have far too many loopholes in, you know, if you broaden out the topic from just looking narrowly at, at internet ads, there are far too many ways right now that people spend money in our elections using LLCs, using C4s, using other um, uh, forms of organizations where the, the source of the money behind that information is, is opaque. And we need to do a better job overall on that, but in particular we can focus in on this very narrow issue of um, making sure that there are disclaimers and that reporters and others who are really interested and motivated to dig in will have a way of finding out where information is coming from and that we at the FEC will have a means of investigating. Because if there's no information at all about where the information is coming from, where, who's posting the ads, then somebody files a complaint and says, I think maybe that's coming from, a, from a, an illegal place, from a foreign source, for example. Um, then. We don't, we don't really have any thread to pull if there's not even a disclaimer on the ad. So this is, this is an important first step. It's a very small first step. It's a baby step, and we need to be doing more. But at least we have, at the, at the uh, famously gridlocked FEC, finally achieved consensus, unanimous consensus, that we need to move forward at least on this. I want to follow up on that, uh, both for you, Commissioner, and also for Katie, um, because what we saw in, in the 2016 election was um, maybe some explicit uh, advocacy ads and, and explicit campaign ads, but we also saw um, other types of issue ad, ads and also ads that uh, impersonated uh, U.S. groups that were perhaps trying to suppress voter turnout um, or uh, misinform people about uh, policy positions that candidates had without saying so explicitly. So would these rules, um, how are these rules considering that type of content or are those off to the side? And then afterwards, uh, I'd love to hear from Katie how Facebook is responding since that's sort of been the epicenter of a lot of these ads and, and, and you've gotten a lot of tension recently for that. 
And, and let me start by saying that when we uh, proposed that we were going to launch into this rulemaking, uh, we did get, I, I specifically asked Facebook and Google and Twitter to comment, and they all did, and they all actually welcomed the initiative, which we very much appreciate. We need to work hand in hand with um, the folks who are so much more tech savvy than certainly I am. Um, because I think that the very smart people who brought us the internet and who brought us platforms like Facebook um, can help us to figure out, you know, who's a human and who's a bot. Um, I, I'm not in a position to do that, but I'm, I'm betting that there are smart people out there in the tech world who, who can do that and who can help to get behind where the money is coming from. I mean, it's pretty obvious to say, you know, people shouldn't take ads in rubles, but, you know, that's that's not going to last very long. You know, like now that that's been made public, I think we can expect that people are going to be using other mechanisms to, uh, to fund advertising. And uh, this has to be a concerted effort um, by all of us. Uh, right now, our rules on disclosing issue ads, uh, the kind of very disturbing ads that we have learned about where people from outside our country are actually trying to use this platform that is designed to um, and has the capability to promote so much citizen engagement uh, in a positive way. Instead, there are um, malevolent characters outside our country who are using this platform and the very freedoms that make it so positive and strong to undermine it and in fact to promote dissent and discord and and this is by the way let me just say a, ought to be a completely bipartisan or nonpartisan issue because the fact that people may have intervened on behalf of one party in one election is no guarantee that they're not going to turn around and say, oh, and the best way to promote more discord is to now intervene on behalf of the other party in the next election. So we are all, uh, all of us who care about politics and want to engage in politics are at risk on this. Um, and I think it is uh, really important that we beef up our disclosure and um, the disclaimers are a narrow issue, but also the disclosure um, uh, more broadly across political advertising, including issue ads, but that is likely going to require some help from Congress, the Honest Ads Act, the Disclose Act. Um, these are waiting to be enacted in Congress, and I, I really hope that this will um, help push them to a place where stronger laws can be enacted um, that will make our system more transparent, and then we can step in and um, shore that up with stronger regulations. And, you know, on the Facebook side, there's a handful of steps that we are taking um, when we think about this issue that we're doing regardless of, of legislation or regulation and something we're also looking globally. So the first thing that we're doing is that, um, and we're currently testing this in Canada, is you're going to be able to go to any page on Facebook. Doesn't matter if it's political, doesn't matter if it's a brand, you're going to be able to see the ads that they are currently running on the platform. So you're going to be able to just see the creative. Um, it's not going to have any um, of who's seeing it or um, how much money they've spent. But it's one of the small steps we want to take in terms of that tricky issue of um, what are issue ads versus political ads and things of that nature. Um, so we figured that just transparency for all pages and the ads that they were running was a small step that we could do in that direction. That's something that we plan on rolling out globally later this year um, in addition to the United States. And then, starting with just U.S. federal elections, and we certainly have plans to expand this out um, more, but it will it will take some time given all the different rules in every single state and in every single country. Um, one thing is we will be labeling political ads as such and having the disclaimer that will be at the top of the of the ad. Um, advertisers will be able to self-select into that, but then we will also be looking for ads that, particularly ones initially that are the express advocacy, such as the commissioner mentioned. Um, and if they're expressly asking for a vote or to vote against a certain candidate or about the election, um, they will not be able to run those ads until they add that disclaimer. We will also be looking at authorizing um, the people who are running those ads, making sure they're real people, um, making sure they are United States citizens and they're authorized on behalf of whether it's the campaign, political party, organization, whomever it is, that they're authorized on behalf of them to be running ads um, advocating, advocating for them.
for them. And then for just political ads, mainly the ones that are being run by, by candidates and, and other organizations that have to file with the FEC or, or the IRS, there's going to be a four-year political archive. That's going to start from the minute we launch it. So it's not like you're going to be able to go back and see ads all the way back to 2014. It's going to start building from when we're able to turn that on. That's going to allow you, there we will show the basic demographics of who saw the ad. So age, location, and gender. The reason we're doing that versus who they're being targeted is many campaigns use what's called our custom audiences feature, where they're uploading their own um, lists of people and we're matching them and then showing them the ads. So we don't necessarily know who was on that list. So we figure the best thing we can do is at least show who was who saw the ad. And then we're, we're also planning on showing how much they spent, though the specifics of that we're still trying to work out. Do we do it by ad? Do we do it by campaign? Do we do it by day? There's a lot of different options there that we're trying to that we're trying to work through to help provide more of this transparency um, and authentication of people who are buying political ads on our platform. I just want to follow up on the issue ads specifically. Um, you talked about uh, publishing the currently running issue ads on pages, but there are, I would imagine, hundreds of thousands of pages, if not more, and quite easy to make new pages. So it's, uh, it could be difficult for investigators to kind of uh, go look to see if there are problematic ads if they don't know which pages might be promulgating those ads. So can you tell us anything about what Facebook might, is doing to prepare um, to be on the lookout for those problematic ads that we wouldn't think to even go look for? We're trying to think through what's the best way to potentially surface those types of ads um, ads to us. There's certainly different types of issues, such as immigration or other issues that are, tend to be the ones that cause the more, most discourse that we saw here. But we also want to be thinking, we want to make sure we're not fighting the last election in this one. Um, and there's always going to be new ways that they're trying to, to look at it. So there's a lot more work that we absolutely need to do. Um, but we also want to make sure that even that we're taking these initial small steps at first um, to be able to take care of those areas while also trying to figure out how we can potentially surface some of those other types of advertising that's happening. Thanks. Um, and to pick on you a little bit more, that's but <laughs> uh, on, on the good side and on the bad side, um, the internet has provided new tools for campaigns themselves to uh, reach out to voters, to reach out to, for gover the governments to reach out to citizens um, and to engage uh, their constituents to you know, uh, express themselves and to, to ask for what they want. So can you tell us sort of how elections have changed? And, and this, I know this is something you personally are very involved mm -hmm. in all around the world. Um, and also, as you've also been criticized for it, for working too closely with, with um, governments that are more authoritarian and where, where the same tools that we might um, uh, celebrate here could be turned um, to sort of perpetuate uh, the powers that be in countries where it's harder to um, turn over uh, new governments. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think overall, um, our goal is to make sure more people can have a voice when it comes to our civic our civic products um, and to protect that. Um, We've done a lot of work globally and here in the United States of helping to make sure people have the right knowledge when it comes to elections, that they know how to register to vote, that they know um, when election day is, that they know what they need when they go to the when they go to the polls, what IDs are things that they need, so that they know that who's on the ballot and they have the ability to compare and contrast what their positions are between the different candidates. Because you know, a lot of people may know who they're voting for for president, but they may not know who's running at their more local level, which is where they can actually have the most impact. And we don't just do work around elections either. We're also looking after elections. We have products such as our town hall products here in, this, in the states and other places where people can go and follow any of their elected representatives on Facebook so that they can be having those types of those types of conversations. I think it's important to note too, you know, when we work with political parties or candidates, we're working with with, we're giving everyone the exact same tools and best practices on, on what they can use. And we're also working closely with civil society groups and other NGOs and international groups such as NDI or IRI, um, who may also be working in these different countries um, of helping people to understand how they can use our platforms in order in order to engage. It's something that you know we have to keep evolving on and, and looking at and, and being critical in terms of what it is that, um, how our platforms are being used, but nobody is above our community standards. 
Um, that's why we publish our government transparency report so that people know there are requests that we're getting from governments, which ones we actually, um, how many of those we actually comply with versus how many of those that we've we've pushed back on. Um, so it's, it's constantly a, a work in progress, but um, I'm overall really proud of the work that we've done around civic engagement and the fact that it has never been about making money. It has always been about how can we do more of helping people to be informed voters and to engage on the platform. And that's something that I just really like about how Facebook in particular has approached this. Thanks. So the, what you started to talk about was, you know, these are tools that are available to anyone really to, uh, to engage politically. So I wanted to um, turn to Sonia to tell us sort of how different governments and different, uh, different countries are really seeing these tools being used and, and how that has facilitated either the spread of democracy or uh, uh, some of the erosion of it. I know in particular, um, freedom of expression is certainly a, a critical component of, of any sort of democracy. And we're seeing uh, more and more movement to governments looking at the content that's posted online and uh, trying to decide what's fake and what's real and what's legitimate and what needs to be taken down. And that, that can certainly be problematic, um, especially going into elections where we need to be, ha need to be having debates. Um, so Sonia, can you tell us about a little bit more about what you found in this most re recent year and what your biggest um, hopes and concerns are? Uh, absolutely. So uh, it seems like uh, a lot of us and a lot of people uh, have started paying attention to this issue of manipulation because this is something that we have seen over the past couple of years in the United States and in Western Europe. But uh, what our report showcases is that this is actually a global problem and this is not a new problem. Um, the latest edition of Freedom on the Net actually uh, demonstrates that over the past year alone, out of 65 countries that we examined, in 18 of them, we saw different types of manipulation playing a role in elections or referenda. And there are different ways how this is being uh, displayed. So one of the most common ways is actually governments uh, and political parties hiring so-called paid uh, pro-government commentators. So these would be uh, everyday citizens who sometimes um, respond to an ad and they're then employed by the government to post comments either favorable to the government or defending their policies or actually writing negatively about uh, political opponents. Uh, this also is not a new practice. This is something that was pioneered in China uh, 12 or 13 years ago and many of you might be familiar with the 50 cent party where um, China has employed tens of thousands of individuals and, uh, and the government would pay them 50 cents uh, per each post that they were posting. But we see this now actually widespread. So it's no longer just China and Russia, but it's governments like Vietnam, the Philippines, Turkey, and so forth. In the Philippines, for example, during the most recent election, uh, the current government was, uh, and the government of the current president was paying uh, $10 per day to so-called public opinion shapers. And now after the elections, they uh, continue to be employed by the government. Uh, so uh, these commentaries are one way, but there are others. So for, for example, pol uh, political bots is also something that's a huge problem and perhaps less so on platforms like Facebook because that's a closed platform. But the issue of bots is so widespread on platforms like, like Twitter. So even in uh, some of democratic states like Mexico, we've seen over the past few years, government employed, uh, employing tens of thousands of bots which have different ways of functioning. So in just one example, we've seen during anti-government protests in Mexico, um, we've seen um, on Twitter uh, people posting uh, examples of police brutality and warning other protesters uh, just to stay away from uh, certain areas. Well, immediately when those posts started uh, coming up through this method called uh, hashtag poisoning, we actually saw just bots overwhelming the hashtag. So then people who were trying to actually find this information, they were unable to do so. And this had this real life impact because people were not able to avoid uh, police brutality. Also the issue of fake news. I think many times has been said that the issue of fake news is uh, not new. Uh, it's been present for uh, hundreds of years, 
But uh, because of this new environment, we see fake news uh, being uh, spread much more quickly. And again, you know, this is uh, an issue that we've seen in so many places over the past year, whether that be our country or Armenia or uh, Ukraine or, uh, or Kenya. I mean, in Kenya, for example, there were public opinion polls that showcase that over 80% of electorate was exposed to uh, uh, so-called fake news uh, during the last elections. So again, you know, this is a global problem and pe perhaps we are behind in discussing it in this country, but it is something that has been present for over a decade. And, uh, and I'm quite excited that uh, we are finally talking about the solutions because again, you know, when we talk about these solutions, they should not be just applicable to our own country, but they should be global solutions. So um, as you mentioned, having a platform to speak is uh, less and less meaningful if our voices are drowned out. And so uh, they're simultaneously moved toward um, regulation both here in the US and especially in, in the UK and in Germany to try to proactively have uh, to compel platforms to be taking down this type of, of content, both harassment, hate speech, fake news, um, and to do so very quickly which is forcing the companies to turn to automated tools, which are not that good at context and which are not um, always the best at determining who's a bot and who's real and whose voice is legitimate and uh, whose is destructive. So um, are we cutting off our nose to spite our face? Um, are we, you know, what, what effect will that sort of backlash or that sort of knee-jerk reaction to this phenomenon have on internet freedom overall and sort of how, how are the companies also responding to this? Yeah, so um, I want to clarify that some level of regulation can actually be positive. And uh, we talked about, uh, for example, new rules regarding uh, transparency in political advertising. And, uh, and I think that can actually lead to very positive change. But as you mentioned, what we've seen in many places is this uh, knee-jerk uh, reaction. So what we found over the past year is that 14 countries, in order to deal with this very legitimate issue of fake news, have actually passed new rules or new legislation that actually restricts internet freedom. And this is a problem. Um, you mentioned the case of Germany, and for us, that has been particularly problematic. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Germany recently passed a law that um, requires social media companies uh, to take down uh, hateful content and fake news, and, uh, and it requires them to essentially pass their own judgment of th what that involves. And if they don't do this, they can actually um, face up to 50 million euros in fines. So uh, part of the reason why this is problematic is because there is no judicial oversight uh, you know, wh when it comes to these procedures. And what we've seen uh, through the years is that when you place such restrictions and such rules on the companies. Companies then uh, have a lot of incentive to, you know, just try to, to just to take down information that, uh, that uh, might not necessarily fall under this law, but they, you know, they don't want to risk uh, paying all these high fines. Just to also give you an example of how kind of similar rules have played out um, in some of the other countries, uh, you know, uh, there was this issue of also companies being liable for intellectual property uh, rights, for example, in the UK. And, uh, and again, companies were supposed to proactively take down or face, you know, whether that be defamation charges or intellectual property charges and so forth. So one of my colleagues, um, some years ago, I uh, ended up doing an experiment where he actually wrote to a number of companies, and this was internet service providers, and this was over a decade ago, but he wrote to a number of them and just said, I'm a descendant of John Stuart Mill, and the fact that there are all these websites, you know, with John Stuart Mill's works is actually infringing upon, <laughs> you know, my family's legacy, so therefore you're supposed to take them down, otherwise I'm going to sue you. And interestingly, many of the companies that he wrote to just took it down without challenging it. And, uh, and I think this really nicely showcases that, you know, some companies, they obviously have very str strict practices how they consider these things, and uh, we applaud them. But many other companies throughout the world just don't. And, uh, and uh, I think when, when you place those laws, uh, then you really risk uh, uh, over censorship in a way that uh, the laws did not intend. Yeah, how is Facebook uh, reacting to these actual laws and proposed laws? 
I mean, we're certainly having to, you know, working to comply with them as best we can. But I think zooming out a little bit, what we're trying to do is when we look at these issues, there's sort of a five-pronged approach that we're looking at. The first is what more can we be doing around taking down fake accounts and understanding what is a, a fake account, because that keeps evolving as well um, as, as bad actors keep getting smarter trying to do what we can in terms of disrupting the economic incentives. A lot of what we saw in terms of people sharing false news and, and creating the pages and all that weren't doing it necessarily because they were ideologically driven one way or the other. They more just wanted the clicks so that they could make money. Um, so the more we can do to disrupt those incentives, the, the better. <clears throat> Third, we're looking at, so we don't take down fake false news or anything like that, what we do is we call downrank it, which means it's not going to get as much um, reach on our site. We also flag for people if they've shared something that a third party fact checker has marked as false. We give them a warning before they share it. Um, but we're trying to do um, more of that work of downranking clickbaity type content. Uh, I mentioned the 30 party, third party fact checkers. That's the fourth one. Um, we don't think that we should be the ones deciding what is or not true. Um, that should not be the role of companies such as ours. And so trying to work with fact checkers as much as we can here in the States and abroad. Um, but that gets harder and harder in a lot of these countries where there isn't necessarily a fact checking ecosystem for us to tap into. And then fifth, with our civic engagement tools, trying to do what we can to make sure that people have the most accurate information that they can when it comes to elections. Great. So we just have a couple minutes left, and, and we've covered everything that we could possibly cover, I'm sh as I'm sure you've uh, seen. Um, so just to close out, I, I would love to hear from you. There are so many different ways we can be tackling all of these different issues. What do you think the most important thing for um, the government to be focusing on at this moment is and, and for the public to be paying attention to, especially as we move into the upcoming election here uh, and thinking ahead? And I'll start with the Commissioner Weintraub. Um, I'm going to echo what Sanjay said. Uh, I think it's all about disclosure. It's disclosure. If you know where the information is coming from, then it empowers the citizens to make smart choices about what they're going to share and what they're going to read. Uh, and it takes us out of the entire um, field of trying to tell people what they can and can't say, which obviously is, would be deeply problematic. But what we need to do is give people the tools to figure out where this information is coming from. And that's where I think our, our focus needs to be. And I, in addition to transparency and uh, disclosure, I would just mention the value and the role of public education, because we see many of these government efforts uh, being successful, in part because people can be duped. So uh, in order for people to be more informed and better informed citizens, I do think that we need to invest much more to educate them how to access the internet, how to discern which information is credible information. Um, thank you. Um, uh, to pick up on Sonia's point, um, election officials and, and machines can be duped as well. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we need to have checks and we need to have better equipment. And uh, the, the bipartisan bill that um, Senator Klobuchar mentioned repeatedly today is one that I believe deserves all of our support. Um, and uh, I would remind you, too, that um, election operations are funded at the state and local levels. So consider what you can do and um, what kind of support you can provide for your local election offices and an encouragement for them to uh, take cybersecurity uh, seriously. So I agree with what everybody said so far. Um, and I would just add that I think it's really important that we keep having conversations like this. These are really, really hard and complicated topics that I think have a wide variety of opinions of what should or should not be done. And the only way that we're going to um, do this in the, in the best way is going to be working together as a community to be discussing those and having those hard conversations over how we should be tackling these things. And it's going to be something we're going to need to be doing you know, over the next couple of years and, and onward. It's not something that I think that we can just hope that by 2018 we'll be done and we can move on to the next thing. And just to echo one of the, the keynotes earlier, we shouldn't be looking to the past and trying to fix those problems. We really need to be looking ahead and, and trying to anticipate what's going to come down the pike because uh, we can, clearly there are many approaches to dealing with, we, with what we've seen now, but 
things are only going to get more complicated um, as technology gets more advanced and actors figure out how to get around whatever uh, uh, interventions we decide that we're going to put in place. So I just want to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Um, it's been really incredible to hear from you all, and uh, I feel more confident that, that we have really smart people working on this problem. And uh, I would invite everyone to, to head back to the keynote room. I believe there is a keynote at 12 o'clock. Thanks for coming.